Please welcome the Come Together Right Now Catalyzing Place Based Impact Investing Ecosystem Panel. Hello, good afternoon. I'm Melanie Audet with Mission Investors Exchange. I'm pleased to be with you today and want to congratulate SOCAP for its 10 years. And it's great to see some familiar faces in the audience uh, and to have this distinguished panel of speakers with me. Uh, this morning at the plenary in this room, we heard uh, Lori Spangler from the UK National Advisory Board say that business as usual has not worked for folks. And I would say that philanthropy as usual has changed and is really beginning to work for folks. And we're going to hear some real life examples of how the work has evolved from what some people in the past has said is old crusty philanthropy into real innovation in communities. We had a great launch pad from the last session uh, it's not your grandpa's philanthropy. And we're going to hear how this is playing out today in communities all uh, So first of all, uh, how many in the room are foundations, private foundations or community foundations? Great. Wonderful to have you here. Um, what about uh, investees who have worked with foundations? Only a few. How about investees who would like to work with foundations? Great. We'll do some matchmaking after this. Um, so Mission Investors Exchange is a network of foundations. And about 12 years ago, there were just a few people uh, who came around the table wanting to know how to make uh, their assets go farther. And that has evolved over the last 12 years into a network that is, uh, has over 200 members all over the United States. And what we're seeing now is uh, foundations working not just in historically what were silos, but really working more intentionally cross-sector and with partners uh, in order to make real change, uh, specifically in place. Um, there are sector-based groups as well, but you know, thinking about community and the SOCAP community, for example, uh, when you think about an ecosystem, it really is a community, and it's defined by those in it. Um, what we're talking about today is really based in research that Mission Investors Exchange uh, has done and is continuing to do to understand how these initiatives in place get started. Uh, we're building out some models for that so that as communities want to do more of this work, we'll have examples uh, and tools that communities can use in order not just to uh, not just for philanthropy to look for investments, but really to be able to collate capital in communities uh, with foundations uh, playing uh, a role, but not the only role in community. Looking to the members of those communities and uh, in, our, uh, in our research, we've seen that there are two really important things uh, in order to build an impact investing ecosystem. One is that uh, it's usually two or three very dedicated people who have a passion for this work. They can't do it alone, however, um, and they can't do it without someone really dedicated to it long term. That dedication uh, has to have support, uh, financial support, and support for other types of actors in the community in order to make real change. This isn't real. This is. This isn't really collective. It is, it is a collective effort to make a real change in place. And that's what we'll be talking about today. So I want to introduce my panelists. First of all is Susan Hamill and, uh, on the end. And Susan describes herself as a philosophy major who went to Wall Street. <laughs> Susan translates between passionate social change makers and expert accountants. In her role as CEO and founder of Cogent Consulting, uh, for us, uh, it, 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 she's based in the Twin Cities. And uh, she's the CEO there, but also has a second job, and she's in her second year, uh, serving as the Minnesota Council on Foundations uh, Executive in Residence. 
And that is a, a role that was funded by the Otto Brummer Trust and the Bush Foundation. And this is a model that already is taking off. And the key in our research is that um, national foundations now are looking to regional efforts, supporting them in helping them to build ecosystems. And that means building uh, a community of investors, a pipeline of investments, uh, investees, uh, networks like Mission Investors Exchange, Gin and Confluence, Tonic, those kind of networks are really essential to bringing the community together, uh, as well as academic institutions and of course uh, advisors and fund managers. And Susan works with all of these different types of actors to build her ecosystem in the Twin Cities. She'll tell us about that today. Um, second, uh, next to me right here, we're gonna skip you, Cynthia, for a minute, is Will Towns. Um, Will is the executive director for Benefit Chicago, where uh, he leads an organization in helping socially motivated businesses and nonprofits access the capital they need to innovate and grow. Previously, Will was at the University of Chicago, where he led the neighborhood initiatives team and its work to fuel economic growth better health outcomes for the South Side communities with high concentrations of poverty. Prior to that, Will worked in the affordable housing, in affordable housing issues related to families and communities at Mercy Portfolio Services. Thank you, Will. Thank you. Um, and last, Cynthia Moeller is with us from uh, W.K. Kellogg Foundation, where she's a program and portfolio officer. She uh, is part of the Mission Driven Investments team, where she is responsible for managing impact investment activities that address systemic barriers that create vulnerable uh, communities for historical marginalized communities and children. Uh, her work includes sourcing and deploying market rate impact investments, ongoing analysis of solutions and trends, and I would add to that creation of solutions uh, and forging trends, uh, fostering alliances with community, corporate, government, and philanthropic partners, and more. So welcome, speakers. Um, I want to start with Susan asking you a question that will help us with our definitions today. Um, in philanthropy, uh, our ter the terminology has really evolved, and now we're using the word impact investing and a, quite a broad definition of impact investing in philanthropy. So I want to ask you first, Susan, because you're one of the uh, pioneers in building an ecosystem in a community, uh, what kind of uh, challenges or opportunities do you see in the definitions? Thank you, Melanie. It's nothing like asking a philosophy ma major <laughs> to define a term, so I'll try not to go on and on. I, I would say the, the term impact investing has, has actually become a barrier in our ecosystem. So we're just talking about investing. Because as the CFO of the Bush Foundation in St. Paul, Minnesota says, every investment has an impact. Right. Some good, some bad. Same with grants positive impact, negative impact. They all have an impact. They're all investments. Some of them have a financial return. Some of them don't have a financial return. So we're actually starting to get away from the term impact investing, and we're saying investing all your assets in a foundation, your people, your convening power, and your money. Invest that for the impact you're seeking in alignment with your mission. Because otherwise, we're finding that the term is dividing the community. So some people will say, I'm doing impact investing, he's not. Or we have a gender lens fund in Minnesota called the Sophia Fund that they don't consider themselves an impact investment fund. They're just smart investing, investing in women-led enterprises. So it's all about investing across the spectrum for both a financial and social return in alignment with your mission. Great. Uh, Will, I want to turn to you and ask you um, to describe a little bit more for the audience about Benefit Chicago. And uh, I also want to ask you the question, is Benefit Chicago an ecosystem building effort in your mind? Great. So that, that's, that's a great question. Again, thank you uh, for having me here today. And I'm uh, happy to, I think, really get into something that we discovered um, as we we're trying to search to solve problems. So, so Benefit Chicago really is about an effort to solve a problem in our community. Right, we know our communities in Chicago and others across the, across the country have communities that just for the fact that there's a lack of capital inflows, the communities can't grow 
and, and really create the impact and things that they need. This isn't a, a lack of ingenuity or creativity or brilliance. It's just a simple fact that for a number of reasons, capital isn't flowing into our communities. So we took that uh, a particular problem and challenge and sort of examined that. The other part of the equation was that we also saw a trend in the uh, uh, need or increase for individual investors to have a local impact, right? We saw that there was a growing group of individuals that were no longer happy with just investing in an Amazon and Apple and Exxon Mobil and all these other companies, but wanted to have some portion of their investments a closer tie to where they live. And so Benefit Chicago was born out of these two problems, really. One, the lack of capital that's flowing into our small social enterprises, and then two, these individuals who are looking to have a closer tie to their investment. And so Benefit Chicago really tried to bridge the gap between those two entities and provide a platform that allows individual investors, corporations, and philanthropists to invest locally uh, in, in their communities. Now, as a part of that, we then have to look at creating segments in which the areas in which we will invest in. And this is where I think the ecosystem building comes in. Uh, we have minimums uh, of investments that we'll make. So as an example, Benefit Chicago's minimum investment is $500,000. Now we realize by setting a bar at $500,000, you're leaving off a number of potential businesses. Where we work on building the ecosystem is we have the ability to invest in those intermediaries that fund those smaller amounts, so the micro lenders, the, 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 the ones 250 to 500,000. And so we look to invest in them, strengthening their capacity to work with those smaller uh, segments in our community and businesses while we continue to work um, with those that meet our criteria. The other way I think that we work on building an ecosystem is really expanding what you consider to be the ecosystem itself, right? So there's the lenders. Uh, we also have our corporations that we work with and partner with, our other philanthropists, uh, foundations and such, that we try to then bridge and make a connection so that the net is tight that doesn't allow anyone to slip through. And so we often will get people who apply to us for funding if we find for whatever reason they don't meet our criteria, we have agreements and partnerships with a number of other lenders and partners within the ecosystem and can refer the application to them, allowing them to continue to sort of work through the system in order to sort of get the support and things that they need. Uh, we also provide social capital with those borrowers that, get to, that we're working with uh, and intellectual capital as well. So we try to look at the entire system in a way that allows us to have High tides raise all ships uh, in a system that allows them to get the capital they need, uh, the way that they need it, and in a timely manner. That, that's a great segue to my question for you, Cynthia. In the plenary this morning, uh, Patricia Ferrar-Riva said that we needed to expand the, uh, the investor, uh, uh, the, the look of the investors, um, where investor investments are coming from. And part of that, she explained, was uh, women as impact investors and people of color as impact investors and your work in racial healing at WK Kellogg Foundation uh, and there's a whole equity, uh, uh, race equity and inclusion track here at SOCAP today um, is really relevant in these conversations. I wanted to ask you um, to, to, to think about and, and help us to understand how Kellogg Foundation's work is helping to redefine the community of investors. What does that mean to, to you and your work? Thanks, Melanie, and, and thanks to SoCal. I'm so pleased to be here today. We, um, I'm with the Kel WK Kellogg Foundation where we um, go to sleep and wake up every day focusing on children. And we want to support children um, particularly those that are vulnerable. And to do this, we have to look at systems. There are a lot of pervasive issues in this country that affect um, how uh, people get access to education, how they access healthcare, affordable housing, um, banking. And so for us, we think about systems in a really expansive way. Um, we, have a, we have kind of a two-pronged strategy. One is through programmatic uh, sector. So you know, the, you know, foundations are like, we're focused on education, we're focused on you know, uh, you know, uh, finance. We, we do that, but we also overlay that with um, our focus in um, specific places. So we're in New Mexico, Michigan, Mississippi, New Orleans, Mexico, and Haiti. Make a lot of sense, right? Um, so, uh, but those are places where kids have the, uh, the the most um, hurdles to, to overcome in, in terms of access to equitable education, healthcare, 
um, financial services for themselves and their families. But how we, we, how we are kind of coupling the programmatic work with our place work is really looking at national trends or even international trends and opportunities and best practices and how we apply them to our communities. And then in the communities, we're actually really focusing on power um, and, and control and having these communities um, be more directive about how they are, what resources they need, um, how they're collecting their own data to, you know, how they actually access the capital markets. And so I'm fortunate to be on a team where we are working really closely on, on the kind of impact investment side with our programming to figure out how do we, how do we use capital um, to empower our communities. So that Benefit Chicago is one of my favorite um, um, kind of place-based work along with um, Minnesota as well because we're starting to see this movement of um, key players, stakeholders, communities really driving this capital. Um, and you know, we'll talk a little bit more about this later, but it doesn't happen overnight. And it really takes you know, a lot of coordination, but also a lot of um, empathy and understanding of the communities and the challenges that they're facing. And that's something we try to bring um, to all of our places in our work. We, we are a foundation when we acknowledge that, we, you know, um, but we also understand the only way that the communities um, that we most care about are if they're to, for some to stand on their own is for them to have the power to do so. And so we, um, we really try and focus on making sure that the community is telling us how they want to show up. And um, it may not be the most streamlined process, but it's definitely a, a process we think will last much longer, long after our funding goes away. Well, I want to express thanks on behalf of the field to W.K. Kellogg Foundation for your work in supporting ecosystem building. Um, and there, you have a commonality really with the other two ecosystem actors on the stage in that all three of our panelists um, either are funders of ecosystem building efforts in the case of W.K. Kellogg, have been funded through a regional association uh, with the uh, Minnesota Council on Foundations with Susan's work, and uh, MacArthur Foundation what is the, um, the funder and uh, launch pad be behind Benefit Chicago. And that, again, is really critical to all of the emerging ecosystems that are being formed up around the United States is that it can't be done without that kind of support. So we really express thanks to all of the foundations who have supported you and us. Um, Susan, my first interaction with you was around the local host committee of the, our Mission Investors Exchange, its national conference in the Twin Cities uh, about three years ago. And at that time, you were working with social entrepreneurs in community. And I'd love to, for you to talk about the evolution of your ecosystem and how that uh, got started. These have happened in various ways. You know, who were the leads? Who were the first in those dedicated individuals that I talked about? Give us a little bit of help on that evolution in Twin Cities for you. Thank you, Melanie. Appreciate that question. Well, we like to trace our investing for impact. We, we trace it back to 1520, to Martin Luther, since uh, Minnesota, is, as, as you all know, it's filled with Lutherans. So we, all, we always have to pay homage to um, many years ago. And I like to bring that up because investing in line with values is, is not a new idea. It, it, yes, the term was coined 10 years ago. But this has been around for a long time. And in Minnesota, actually, we've had foundations who've been doing impact investing, but haven't called it that, for decades. Um, so we have rural foundations who've been investing in their own communities throughout Minnesota, lending money to small businesses, to nonprofits, to meet community needs for 40 years. Some of them are now called community development financial institutions. They're still doing that work. And when I was first appointed uh, executive in residence with the council, uh, they called me and said, Susan, what's this impact investing stuff? We'd like to learn more about it. And I said, well, you've been doing it for 40 years. Uh, so part, that's again where the term kind of trips us up. But three years ago is when the explosion really happened, Melanie. And it was partly thanks to Mission Investors Exchange coming to town it gave us all an excuse to get together. Uh, there are several of us individuals, uh, Rob Scarlett, uh, Jeff Oaks, Brad Brown, we, we had our fingers in different pies. And we could see that there was a lot of activity happening in the Twin Cities, but nobody really knew what the other one was doing. So we said, how about we all get together? And we thought maybe five to 10 foundations would show up. And I think we had 60. 
um, at, at, at a meeting at the Northwest Area Foundation, another foundation that has been doing impact investing for quite some time. Uh, they've dedicated 10% of their assets to impact investing. I um, mean, they're a real leader in this space, including um, being the chair of Mission Investors Exchange, as well as doing a lot of work on impact reporting. Um, but what happened next was the foundations all kind of looked around the room and realized that, um, kind of like you were saying, Cynthia, they all had their, their buckets and their priorities. So if, if an impact investment didn't work for one, it might work for the other. So they started to get to know each other and collaborate and share deals and co-invest. And it started with a group of maybe Northwest Area Foundation, with the McKnight Foundation, um, which has also been doing impact investing for quite some time, the Margaret A. Cargill Foundation, and then we had our community foundations, who actually, uh, one of them have been doing impact investing for at least 10 years, not called an impact investment, but they helped out the city of St. Paul. And so they, they, everyone started to realize that people were, were starting to look at assets other than grant making. They were starting to look at their portfolio, or some of them, particularly the community foundations, seemed to have some kind of squirreled away pots of money, as the, to use a technical term, uh, where they found money that they were able to redeploy out into the community um, in a revolving way so that money would come back in advancement of their mission rooted in place in their community. So in 2013, there were a few doing it. 2014, the conference, there were more and more and more. Then the Bush Foundation stepped up to fund the Minnesota Council on Foundations residency so that all 180 members would, would be able to just call up and get advice on impact investing. Then enter the, the impact hub, Minneapolis uh, got started a few years ago and a lot of their members started asking questions about impact investing, not so much from the sources of capital side, but from the entrepreneur side and the intermediaries and the financial advisors. And we all got together into a community of practice that still exists to this day, and we decided uh, together as a group to map our ecosystem. It started out with 50 people in a room, but at the end of the year, we had uh, invited uh, over 400 people consider themselves part of our ecosystem. And we really view it um, not so much as a net, but we, we view it as a garden. Um, and, and of course, in Minnesota, it's got to be an indoor garden because we want it to grow all year. <laughs> uh, but it's a garden that, that the community owns. Nobody owns the ecosystem. The community owns it and things are growing, and the foundations are there, and they kind of have their own garden as well, but they're part of the ecosystem, and they're helping things grow by investing in the ecosystem, because a lot of this does require the grant capital necessary to make, to make a garden grow. Uh, but then there are other investors who want to get involved, and they can just look on the map and see, oh, you know, I, I didn't know that the Mortensen Family Foundation was doing impact investing, or I, I didn't know that the Otto Bremer Trust was 100, well, 92% uh, impact, you know, aligned with their mission of, of, of investment for the, for the good quality life um, in their region. So we've really seen this ecosystem just explode and it continues to grow, um, partly thanks to the resources you mentioned that are so critical. I mean, a garden needs sunlight, needs water, it needs fertilizer to grow. And the Bush Foundation stepped up, uh, as well as the, the Impact Hub, for another year to make the garden grow even beyond the, the four to 500 people who are involved in it now. I'd love to, to, to get to some additional specifics, so some examples for those in the room around ecosystems. Uh, and I want to turn to you, Will, because this really is advantageous to MIE in building into its next conference as well. Because as you know, Susan, we go out into the community in our conferences and look for impact investing in action. And that really takes uh, those investees uh, playing an enormous role in those communities to help our members and participants at our conference to understand this work better. And so we're going to Chicago next in May uh, of, of next year. And for you, Will, I'd love for you to get to deployment and, and getting money on the ground into uh, projects, into people, 
in your communities. I know that you have started to, to deploy capital from Benefit Chicago, and I'm interested in um, uh, talking about the opportunities that you've seen and where uh, some gaps may exist uh, and where you think you're going from here. Okay, great. I, I think, uh, first of all, as we talked about, um, Benefit Chicago in and of itself is, is an ecosystem in a collaborative way. Right, so we have MacArthur Foundation who helped sort of establish and set this up with their investment. We also have the Chicago Community Trust, uh, which is using their donor advised funds and their sort of network of being a 125 year old organization in the city uh, support. And then uh, the little secret sauce then is the Calvert Foundation, which then allows through the Calvert note, the local resident to invest in the fund itself. And so now you're starting to create an ecosystem where people in their community can walk by a project and say, I'm causing that to happen, right? That, that oftentimes in our communities, we're waiting for someone else to come in and cause things to happen, where oftentimes the, the hand that we need is at the end of our own arm, right? So that we can sort of reach into our pocket and perhaps uh, not get four cups of coffee that week uh, and make an investment that will bring fresh food into your neighborhood that will help open up a daycare center, that will help you know, employ uh, returning citizens uh, into our community uh, uh, to work. And so what we're trying to do with Benefit Chicago to get the deployment, first is really understand what's, what's the demand and what's the market, right? So we deploy the same sort of system. We want to go out and understand. Uh, we want to listen, understand, and then support. Right? And that's how we want to lead with our work. That we're not going in taking over, we're not telling them here's the, how you need the money, but it really is this notion of allowing the community to sort of take shape. So the first in building the demand side is being clear and explaining on what it is. Right? And so often when you have a MacArthur or a trust who are known for giving grants, uh, people first come up and say, I'm here to get one of those Benefit Chicago grants. <laughs> you know? And so we have to really take the time to get them to understand and explain what an impact investment is and why we are lending money and not giving out the grants. And that's sort of our slice of the ecosystem is the, is the loan portion. What we've seen in our roughly 12 months of being active is about 80 applications, uh, totaling roughly about $160 million in requests, um, and really going through that in a very methodical way. We've deployed uh, six investments so far, no two investments are the same. We really take the time to understand the individual business, their needs, how they need the capital, how it should flow into the organization, uh, how are they um, recording and reporting their measurements and impact, and then try to work with them on a term uh, that works to fit the needs that they're doing. And I can give a couple of examples, uh, if you don't mind, about some really interesting things that we've been able to do. Uh, one, uh, there's an organization called Garfield Produce. Uh, this is a two-person right now uh, urban farm, uh, and they sell microgreens uh, in, in the city uh, to about 19 restaurants right now. They got their reputation and got to be a little bit known and caught the ear of Whole Foods, or Amazon, however you, however you want to call it now. And so Amazon said, this is great, we'd like to use your product, we want to come by and see your facility. They said, oh, this is fantastic. Whole Foods shows up to the facility and is like, well, hold on, we can't put this, we can't put this on our shelves. You, you, got, you, know, you got old wood trellises and other things, and you got to convert this to uh, some different standards so that we can make. So we're coming in, actually, at an excellent time to really help them meet those requirements, right? To, to get them onto a path now that they will be able to connect in uh, to Whole Foods and Amazon, which will have a tremendous impact on their business. Uh, this business is run by a young man who's a returning citizen who wants to hire more individuals like himself who have maybe had some run-in in the past when they were young and really sort of use that as his mechanism through this urban farm uh, uh, business that he has. The other thing that we've seen is because we've done the due diligence and the team uh, has really learned the business, this stamp of approval from Benefit Chicago has encouraged other investments to follow. So now we've leveraged up our investment with these outside investors who have also come in to support the business. Uh, and this is part of the work that we're really trying to do. And what you find when talking with them is through the process of applying, they've learned to look at their business differently. They've decided, ooh, we should really be using the board this way. Oh, we weren't measuring this. We should start to do that. And so they've been really appreciative, not only of the, the capital 
uh, that flowing, which is important, but also the process in which they got the capital has helped them view their business differently and has really sort of put them, I think, in an excellent position uh, going forward. Uh, and again, this is a loan that you couldn't traditionally get with the current algorithms that are used by traditional lenders. There's just no way. And so this business could have been on the verge of disappearing from the neighborhood, crushing some dreams of a young man who had gone through some hard times and finally found his way, and instead now is looking at how am I gonna be working with Amazon, right? And that's to me is this an incredible story on how we can really work through the ecosystem uh, to change a trajectory of, a, of an organization. Uh, the second one uh, I'll talk about is an intermediary uh, called uh, Community Neighborhood Initiatives. And this is a, a, a business that has been doing a tremendous amount of work on the far south side of the city uh, and has a number of avenues that they do. They're a micro lender, they help do development, they do a bunch of things. And what we're working with, with them on is the fact that we have a small uh, business, entrepreneur, female-owned business, uh, on the south side that does uh, baking uh, cookies and cupcakes and things. And they were currently situated in a, in a poorly accessible area behind the police station. Now some might say being a bakery and making donuts behind a police station <laughs> is, is a key strategic location. Uh, but they were looking for more of a retail front, right? And so we've made an investment in CNI who's then working with this entrepreneur to get them into a more commercial strip. Their social impact is that they're using food as conversation. So they're not only just baking and sort of selling their goods, but they're using this as a mechanism to draw communities in and start to have conversations about what's going on in their community, in their neighborhood. And so now they're in a prime location on a, um, a mixed-use site that has a Walmart and a number of other sort of businesses that are getting this additional traffic, which is also helping them hire additional people, uh, create more places for gathering and community uh, uh, convening. Uh, and we're starting to see those conversations really come out. Because in a lot of our urban centers, uh, you're lacking places and spaces to gather, right? These are neighborhoods where you don't go near the windows at night, right? You, you tell your kids, get inside and do those kind of things when the lights go down. Uh, and so now you're creating these more vibrant spaces where people are more interacting. Uh, and this is, again, uh, a phenomenal sort of output that we can have through these investments. So we have one direct investment in a small uh, urban farm and sort of the activities that are going there, and then this indirect investment through an intermediary through our funding that's allowing a business to grow and expand. And I think those are two uh, good examples of the things that we're trying to do here. Um, all with the intent of uh, creating wealth for both the business owner, growth and assets, being able to hire people, uh, uh, job creation, Again, putting people back to work we think is uh, an exciting and, and great opportunity. Uh, our, we know our individuals, both young and old, want to work. They're not lazy, they're not sort of, but they're lacking opportunities, so the more we can create that is better. Uh, and then lastly, to support uh, those organizations that help people uh, gain, maintain, and excel in employment. And so we want to ensure that there's different on-ramps at the employment level uh, opportunities uh, for those individuals that are looking for work. And that's really what the ultimate goal of Benefit Chicago is. One of the key ingredients or tools that foundations have is to de-risk investments, uh, to bring on other types of investors. And you mentioned, Will, that uh, Benefit Chicago has seeded interest and follow-on investments by others. And I'm curious what types of investors uh, have uh, have come to these investments. Are they other foundations or are they other uh, types of investment? You mentioned individuals, but as far as uh, institutional, what? So we, we've seen a, a little bit of both. Um, you know, the hardest part when you don't have access to friends and family capital is that first gate, right? It's everyone's very interested until you ask them for a check, right? <laughs> and so we're trying to sort of pave the way a bit that will allow that gate to sort of go, go in. Now, no one, everyone's making an assumption the first person who makes the first investment must know what they're doing, right? I mean, that tends to happen, because I mean, almost immediately after we made our investment, we saw a small investment fund immediately sort of come in following us. I mean, it was weeks after. Oh, the Benefit Chicago, oh, it must be okay. We're coming in. And they had been talking with this particular group for months with no progress. And so we were very pleased to see that we could come in, um, and they're trusting our due diligence, which I, I believe is, is accurate. These aren't uh, fake 
grant, these aren't grants disguised as loans. These are actual loans. We're looking to get people repaid. Uh, and then seeing this additional capital sort of flow back in uh, has been interesting. So there's been a couple of different types. So we've had, there's some, um, in Chicago we have 1871, which is a sort of incubator hub, and there's some offshoots from Impact Engine that have sort of grown. And it's this smaller group that's sort of an offshoot of Impact Engine that's making this investment uh, in uh, Garfield Produce. Uh, they've also been a little more aggressive in taking sort of a seat on the board and sort of helping them sort of grow there. So they've got a very interested partner with some, you know, real background uh, to help them sort of grow. Um, and then we've seen some other uh, grants and other things that have flown in after we have come in, um, after we've uh, been able to sort of do the due diligence to put it in. Uh, it's very early on now, but I think this is a trend that will likely continue as we're strategic uh, in the risk that we're taking, in the businesses that we're supporting, and really based on the support that the community is allowing the business to have. And that's really what we're supporting. As we look to document some of these models in order to share with other communities, um, and I will say that's an offshoot, really the, the funding for our work at Mission Investors Exchange is an offshoot of the successful uh, promotion and launching of Benefit Chicago because uh, we, uh, the MacArthur Foundation has funded research with Urban Institute to do uh, over 60 interviews around the country with these leads in place. So those passionate leaders that I mentioned before are all being interviewed and so that we can take these tools and help other communities to do more of the work. One of those communities that uh, W.K. Kellogg is working in and has for many years is in Santa Fe, New Mexico, Cynthia. And uh, I'd love to know how a national foundation uh, uh, figured out how to work uh, on the ground it, with this intentional ecosystem building. Uh, I know that you have program officers that are dedicated specifically to those communities in Santa Fe, but how did you create the, the additional infrastructure that you needed for your initiative? Sure. So, um, as I mentioned earlier, we have a footprint in the state of New Mexico. We have a uh, little less than a half dozen program officers on the ground in New Mexico. And these are individuals who are from New Mexico, um, have relationships, have been in government, have worked in nonprofits. So they really had a really strong um, kind of on the ground perspective about the community and really deeply embedded, as, as is all of our named places um, across, the, across the foundation. And in New Mexico, um, we had, uh, you know, we started seeing more bubbling up of of interest in opportunity, potential opportunities for investment. However, to do this work well, um, it can't just be the W.K. Kellogg Foundation, right? We are in these places, and certainly you know, we, we carry a little bit of a big stick, but you know, we, we, we know that our role is really to help facilitate. And so um, our team on the ground Start talking to some other foundations, Santa Fe Community Foundation and a couple of other family foundations who are also attending MIE events and reading books and on Twitter and started having this conversation. And um, we um, hired uh, Avivar Capital and Tina's over here somewhere um, who did a really fantastic landscape of the capital needs across the state. So talking to both folks that were in state, out of state, who might have an interest in New Mexico, talking to um, consultants and, and other kind of key stakeholders to really get a sense like what's the opportunity to look like, what's the pipeline look like. And that ended up informing how this cohort of um, foundations and families and, and I think a, a couple of corporations came together and started looking at pipeline. And so, the, so basically there's um, a couple of, of groups that are really helping to drive the pipeline development. So we're working with our grantees and identifying this potential grantees that, you know, might be ready for a PRI or thinking about, um, you know, a, a new um, innovation to, um, we've actually had um, uh, some outside, folks who are outside New Mexico who want to go into New Mexico and helping to connect them to this cohort of folks. And again, all under this rubric of making sure that the, the co-investors in these specific transactions are somewhat aligned. So um, as many of you know, um, as evidenced by our racial equity track, racial equity is a big, um, a big uh, issue for us at the foundation. It's actually what drives 
almost everything we do. We want to see equity um, in all forms, in all of our investments, and so we, we hone in on that pretty strongly. And we're, we're pretty um, clear with our partners, and we work with them. We work with where folks are at how, from how we're thinking about who's benefiting and who isn't on an individual transaction, but also the metrics that we're, we're tracking, you know, and how everyone is using the metrics, not just to track metrics for metrics sake. Um, and so we're really wanting to almost Kate, create this co-investment and, you know, not being exclusive, being, you know, we want more capital coming because that's, we believe our role um, is to use our, our capital and, you know, the riskiest positions in some cases, but also to really um, encourage others to come into the space. And so it's been really exciting for us, the foundation, to watch this particular ecosystem grow because you can see the confidence that the different investors are getting. Now people are bringing deals and all of a sudden we're all, we're all, we're all worried about the payments and you know, loan loss reserves and whatnot. But whereas like a year ago, two years ago, people were like, we'll just leave it to you guys. And so it's really exciting not only to get capital to be deployed, but also building up that infrastructure. For, so, you know, uh, it's not just the Kellogg Foundation, it's the, it's the communities that are really driving it. And I, I do want to make a point. I know we're talking a lot about um, investors that are driving these ecosystems. And we really, we really strive to make sure that our communities are informing us what they need. Um, and so, and that's where I think where our program officers um, and our relationships on the ground come into play making sure that we have an understanding. We're not trying to do these transactions to do these transactions, right? We're really trying to affect systemic change in these places that not only um, benefit, you know, New Mexico, but also could benefit, you know, Kansas or any other state that might be thinking about such an um, ecosystem. And um, for us, that's a really com critical component. Um, I think when impact investing the term really was coined, I think there was a lot of excitement and wanting to get the deal done, but not really thinking about what happens after the deal is closed, how do we deal with workouts, how do we navigate this as a group? And I think the eco ecosystem, particularly in New Mexico and, and Michigan and Minnesota, are creating these um, kind of almost checks and balances where mm -hmm. the group is going all in together, knowing that they're taking on risk, knowing that this may fail, and also trying to mitigate together as well, which I think is just as important because some of these deals are not going to be strong. You know, things are going to happen. We, you know, we, we can see how things can kind of switch really quickly. And so not only is it about ensuring the capital is there, but also understanding, like, what are we going to do when times get tough as a group individually? Mm -hmm. so. uh, education has been a big part of the work I th of all three of your efforts. And I'd love to ask you, Susan, about education, because I know you've done a lot of it in Twin Cities over the years. Uh, can you talk about educating um, unlikely players in the ecosystem? So uh, players that, you know, for our case, focus on foundations, foundations wouldn't normally work with. And are you getting them around the table? And what are some of the cultural barriers that you've seen working cross-sector, working uh, interculturally, I guess you could say, as a philosopher. Let's give us your, your opinion on that. Sure, I'm sure, <laughs> your experience. I'm sure Socrates uh, had an opinion on that, but I would say that in our ecosystem, you know, we, we really engaged all, all players. So we've got the sources of capital, we've got the users and the investees who need the capital, the intermediaries, and then kind of the field builders underneath. And we need, we need them all to be involved. And even in the foundation community, we're working with people from different parts of the foundation. You know, tear down those walls between the investment side and the program side. Those sides are getting blurry now. Some of the program officers are going to the investment committee meetings. Some of the investment committee folks are going on site visits. You know, there's, there's, a, there's a blurring now. So even within a foundation, we're dealing with different people, the chief investment officer, sometimes the advisor, the consultant. So even within the foundation, as a council, we're, we're dealing with different parts of, of our member organizations. Within the ecosystem, we're really lucky to have an impact hub where everyone is welcome. Every, it's very inclusive. All are welcome. The barriers to entry to joining are very low, so everyone can come. And we have actually have this really extraordinary group of uh, including financial advisors. 
And, and sometimes they're kind of missing from these meetings and from these conversations. And yet they're critical to uh, mainstreaming this idea of investing for impact. So we have a group of financial advisors who come to our meetings regularly. And even though they are technically competitors, um, in this area, learning, learning about impact investing, responding to their clients who are asking about it, particularly their family clients, as the, as the next generation, the millennials, are you know, turning 34, 35, they're getting onto the boards of these foundations. They're asking their mom and dad's, grandpa's advisors, how come we're not investing in accordance with our family mission? Why, why is it just 5%? What about the other 95%? So we've, we've found we need to create a safe place where people can come together as an ecosystem and safe means all sorts of things. It means that everyone's welcome. We also bring a, a, a DEI lens to everything we do. And so we're, we're thinking about inclusivity in lots of different ways. But one is that it, it, we have created a pitch-free zone so that the foundations, when they do come to ecosystem events, they're not going to get you know, grabbed. And so it's a safe place for them as well. Um, but then we're also working in, in terms of the pipeline and an education. One of the findings of our ecosystem work is that guess what? There's a disconnect between what the investors want and what the investees need. So the investors, you know, they want market rate investments aligned with their mission. They're going to achieve a great impact and never have a workout or a problem. That's mm -hmm. what they want. In the meantime, we've got investees who want Hundred your money at zero percent. Thank you very much. An actual quote from one of the entrepreneurs <laughs> in our study. Uh, and I was just talking to an entrepreneur today who said he'd really like it if he didn't have to pay any interest ever whatsoever. You know. Um, so we have this disconnect. And what we found in in communities that don't have the friends and family or can't go to the golf course with, you know, Uncle Bob and and ask Uncle Joe to fund your latest venture we have to invest in the ecosystem. And that's where foundations can really play a critical role. So we're excited in Minnesota, one of the great initiatives that grew up out of our growing garden of our ecosystem is something called Connect Up Minnesota. And um, the, the inspiration behind that is in the front row there, Elaine Rasmussen, CEO of Social Impact Strategies Group. But this is to get money into the hands of people who don't have a pathway to that friends and family round. So the education, and that is gonna to lead to a pitch event. So what we found with education is, is we really have to meet people where they are and talk in the terms that they can understand. So as a, as a CFA, a chartered financial analyst, if I go talk to the chief investment officers, the fund managers, the investment consultants, there is some language that I use. If I'm going to go talk to all my program friends and my, you know, nonprofit and social entrepreneurs, there may be different language. I think the important thing, though, is to draw that, always be thinking about who's not in the room. You know, are, are the, you know in, in the Twin Cities, we have a large Native American community. Are they in the room? Uh, what about rural? Are rural friends, are they in the room? LGBTQ, socioeconomic disadvantage, is, is ever, you know, African American, are they in the room? And they are, but not, not in the numbers or, or at the table as much as we'd like. So I think that education is critical, but it also has to be targeted to each audience. We heard a challenge this morning in the plenary uh, uh, about the creation <laughs> of an impact advisors, uh, a specialty in, in uh, the advisory community. So I think all of us together will probably uh, put a check mark beside that as something that we, we might see coming down the line. Well, the CFA Institute has incorporated ESG into uh, CFA level one, into the test. Right. Right. So this, this idea of risk analysis is really, that is becoming mainstream, Melanie, absolutely. Mm -hmm. I just want to add something on the, on the, when you were thinking about the ecosystem and we're thinking about the pipeline, I think one of the gaps that we're trying to address in, in our places, but what I'm seeing across the field is we get these investors together, they're all, they get, go through all of the trust building, but then 
the pipeline doesn't match up, right? Or the pipeline's right. not there. And so I think that's kind of the next wave. Right. And I think, you know, groups like Impact Engine, Village Capital, and others are really helping to really stimulate that pipeline. But I, I would really encourage for those of you who are thinking about your ecosystems, and whether they're sectors or, or geographies, to really keep that in mind, because I think that's where things fall. Everyone gets excited about doing the deals together. They're like, oh, wait, <laughs> there's nothing for us to invest in, or it's not ready. And I, and I think the other thing, the other angle on the education piece, and I also include this in the ecosystem, are our universities. Oh, yeah. Right, so how do we start to work very closely with our universities to get this into the curriculum so that these individuals, if they don't go into impact investing, right. perhaps they're running a business, perhaps they're leaders at some point or on a board of an organization mm -hmm. and can start to have this sort of come in top down, bottom up. And I think that that's incredibly important. I think we also, though, need to expand which universities we work with, right? <laughs> so here, uh, it seems st everything is Stanford, Stanford, Stanford. <laughs> Back in Chicago, everything's University of Chicago or Northwestern. If I'm in Boston, everything's Harvard. We have to look at our, our, our educational systems across the board at a number of institutions that can get that in. It's great for those who can get into those institutions. They're phenomenal institutions and do a great job of educating. But far more individuals are at our community colleges, at our city colleges, at our state-run uh, facilities and institutions, and getting them to sort of participate I think and understand the impact of the work that we're doing, it will be incredibly helpful in moving this um, uh, industry uh, forward in the future. Mm -hmm. Well, I also think, if, if I may jump in on education, I think to really build the, the pipeline of impact investing and leaders of, of tomorrow, I do think we need to reach into universities to people studying finance and studying investment, sure. but even go to people who aren't studying That's those right. topics because they think maybe finance is is boring and, and only for white men, which if you go to a CFA conference, you'll see what I mean. No, no, no disrespect to, to the white men in the room, but I think that if we could let the, peop the students know that they could study interesting topics like education, or environment, or uh, economic development, and earn their financial credentials, I think we would open up the field to more people. So I do think that uh, meeting with people who are interested in finance and letting them know that there are different career pathways out there because then they can become the fund managers of, of tomorrow. Yeah, and, I, and I would say that's both on the lending, finance, yes. and on the borrowing, entrepreneurship. Yeah, that the, we whole, need on both the whole sides. spectrum, yeah. Do you see a, an avenue uh, from MBA uh, schools to uh, to, to real jobs now in uh, philanthropy or in investment firms as impact investors? Is there a good well, outlook for that in think, your communities? Well, I, I think that the, we were talking about the blurring that's occurring earlier. Yep. I think what we'll start to see is corporations really start to blur the lines as well. And it will become more difficult to determine whether this is just a, a ploy of the corporation or are they truly being philanthropic. Um, and they're doing this in more and more real time, right? Um, uh, Cam Newton makes a comment about a female reporter. Dan and Yoga drops him the next day. That's right. Uh, Pres uh, President Trump uh, says there's big water, lots of water around Puerto Rico. Um, Walmart the next day says, Puerto Rico, despite the water, we're still united, right? And so we'll start to see these corporations start to take different roles as they realize that the government's not going to solve it on their own. Philanthropy can't do it by themselves. And even the impact investment group will need support. And I think we'll start to see this trend continue as women and millennials push us uh, uh, and demand that we sort of look at things this way. And Generation Z is even stronger than, than the millennials. And so we'll start to see this blend. So your opportunities may expand to non-traditional impact investment type positions outside of what we currently see as opportunities today. Well, I do, and I, oh, go yeah. ahead. No, go ahead. Well, I was just going to say, you know, I think on the work, and for those of you that were in the session this morning around the business case for racial equity, that's exactly what we're trying to get to, right? Showing the opportunity for reframing how we think about communities and not as, you know, not as uh, a deficiency, but as an opportunity. Right. And I think the more that we start to see that play out, and we already have a tremendous number of examples of this, we'll start to see those opportunities in a much different way. And I think, you know, we'll have to do the track of changing the system. So, you know, some of these conferences are a bunch of white dudes, but, you know, really opening it up. But I think in ways where 
we, all of us in this room and beyond, start to think about the opportunity, not thinking about a below market or market rate, but really yep. thinking about what is needed and what's the capital and other resources that we have to deploy. I, I would, I agree with everything you're saying, but a, a slightly cautionary note is I, I don't think there are enough jobs that are 100% impact no. investing. There, there are only a handful of those positions across the whole country. I, I'd say maybe two handfuls. <laughs> so I think for people who want to get into this field, I think it's important to have a well-rounded uh, toolkit, whether it's in philanthropy or an investment or social entrepreneur. So actually when, when the people call me from the MBA school and they want to get into impact investing, I, I tell them, go get into investing. And, and kind of worm your way into impact investing or into, into a company. We, we just have a, an MBA uh, grad from the University of Minnesota who's, who's gone to work for Ecolab, which is doing a lot of great work in water. We also have um, some very interesting innovations coming in to, with corporations, so I agree with you, Will, on that. But I actually am cautioning people not to just um, peg themselves into this one part of the whole financial industry, which is actually quite an interesting, diverse place where they could plug into a lot of different ways. And just like we need to bring DEI lens into everything, not as a separate bucket, we need to bring this idea of aligning investment for impact into all of it. So we kind of deploy them out throughout the industry. This is a real inflection point for foundations as well. And when we think about the expertise that comes out of those who have been working in philanthropy for so many years, uh, the thematic expertise, for, for, for instance, on the program side, um, and when you think about either your foundation or others, do you see opportunities existing for those program officers with 20 plus years of experience to be involved uh, as impact investors or in these conversations in your e in the ecosystem building? I mean, take. Uh, from, from my, my last year at the Kellogg Foundation, I think absolutely we need those program officers to um, add this new language of investing into their, into their rubric of tools, right? And so at the Kellogg Foundation, while it's not perfect, we are certainly starting to blend those teams quite frequently. Actually, we brought like half of our racial equity team here today who does all of our programming there. But we really want, um, and we, I think there's an opportunity within the broader philanthropic space to start that blending and having those conversations and, and going through the discomfort of trying to, you know, feeling a little dumb in, in an investment discussion or, you know, or feeling a little dumb on the program side. So I think, I think there's a trust building because quite frankly, the issues that we are addressing today in this environment are far outweigh how much capital we have individually, and the only way to start to address this is going to be around this, this, this ecosystem, understanding different perspectives, having empathy and, 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 and patience to go through these conversations and, um, and to support you know, the deployment of more capital, because otherwise we're just all going to work in our silos and nothing's going to get done. Absolutely. We're really seeing as some of our foundations in Minneapolis, St. Paul, and Northwest Area Foundation is using the same... Uh, uh, organizational structure is Heron, Heron where, where they're not, there aren't silos anymore. You're, you, you have access to all the resources of the foundation. We're seeing, um, you know, at the Bush Foundation, uh, program officers going to investment committees meetings and vice versa. So we're, there's so much wisdom in the program uh, staff in terms of knowledge about some of these important issues facing our communities. And I think the investment side can really tap that knowledge. So you don't always have to hire a consultant to tell you your strategy in education. You, you probably know that in-house if you go ask your grant side. Same on the impact evaluation and reporting. Go ask the grant team. They've been asking for grant reports for years, and they've, they've got, there's got great wisdom there. Yeah, I, I would just say uh, it's, I think, in, in fact, true that the in, in investment officers um, Play a, play a key role. The one thing I do think we do need is diversity within the officers, right, that come from different backgrounds mm -hmm. and from different locations on both the investment side and on the officer side, so that there is some uh, uh, under, more understanding or someone at least within the institutions that can help sort of translate some of the, the uh, hurdles and difficulties uh, that happen in, in, in our communities. And it's this sort of triple juggling act that we all have to do, right? Mm -hmm. we, we have to be scholars, and be able to sort of understand and measure the impact mm -hmm. and talk about history and lit reviews, 
Uh, we have to be practitioners, understand how things are actually happening on the ground, and then sometimes we have to be activists, right? And we have to sort of be able to merge between these three sort of activities and then change how we talk about it. As you said earlier, if I'm talking to a CEO this way, if it's uh, uh, Gonzalez, I talk this way, if it's Jamal, you gotta talk Jamal this way, all in a way to sort of get them to sort of understand, to get them where we need them to be. And that comfort in being able to play those different roles uh, becomes critical uh, in, in helping move the field forward. And I think that's a great point because it gets back to, to Susan's point around, you know, folks are not, folks coming out of um, business school, you know, there's, there's not enough jobs here, but if there's, you learn this agility, right? Sure. And you're able to uh, translate for different audiences and that comes from being in a, in a, a bunch of different positions and a bunch of different sectors and organizations. Cynthia, thank you. Will, thanks. Susan, would you like to continue this conversation? If, if you do, there is a session following where you'll hear real life examples of how foundations have uh, worked with their investees to create real deals. It's in the firehouse. It's the last in our series today, in our Spotlight series at SOCAP. We've been so privileged to be here and to share your wisdom and knowledge. We really appreciate it. Continue the conversation with us at the firehouse next. Thank you. Thank you.